Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to be here. I want to introduce my family to begin. By the way, I really enjoyed that song by Roger. I haven't heard guitar music in church in quite a while, but I love guitar music. In fact, I went to Minnesota for a week vacation just kind of to relax and get away. And my brother is a guitarist, and he has a guitar band. And so he and I were playing guitars together and had a wonderful time. So Roger, beautiful song. Love the guitar. And where is is Julie. Excellent, excellent storyteller. I enjoy that immensely. Well, let me introduce my, my family. If my wife could stand up, and my daughter, and my son. I have three children. My wife, we've been married for 28 years. She is an accountant, and my daughter, she graduated from Southern University with a degree in elementary ed, and spent three years at an orphanage uh, teaching the children there in the beautiful country of India. Now she is living in the country of Norway. Uh, my wife and I are of Norwegian descent. My father was born and raised in Norway, moved to America when he was 23 years of age. And my wife's grandfather moved from the country of Norway to America. So we both have family members out in Scandinavia. And my youngest son is a student at Indiana Academy and is called Portering this summer, doing a good job. Then we have one more child, and his name is Matthias. So my wife's name is Marie, my daughter's name is Gabrielle, and my youngest son's name is Caleb. But then we have an older son by the name of Matthias, and he is working in Orlando, Florida, at our hospital there. And he's a graduate from, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Southern University. Uh, I graduated from Andrews University with a D-Min degree, and I really enjoyed my time there. And I have to say, we have so many godly professors there. And... Um, but I spent 10 years of my profession teaching anatomy and physiology, biology, and Bible. I really enjoy science. And then for the past, what, 21 years, I have been pastoring. And I have a number of friends here this morning from the Carmel Church. And, and uh, for those that have been attending Carmel, could you stand up, please? Just great people. So. They're awesome people, awesome people, and hopefully we can do some fishing and reel them in here, huh? <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to know you. Um, I have a burden on my heart, and that is evangelism. I really believe that the Lord is coming back soon, and God has raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church with a special end-time message. Now, that, that doesn't mean that God loves us more than anyone else. But according to Revelation chapter 14, we see God's end-time message clearly spelled out in that particular book, in that particular chapter. The everlasting gospel must go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people before what great event? The second coming of Jesus. And connected with the everlasting gospel, the message of justification by faith is worship God who made heaven and earth and the sea, which is a direct link to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, the fourth commandment. And we're living in the time period of the judgment. And according to Daniel chapter 7, you and I don't have to be afraid of the judgment as long as we're putting our faith and confidence in Jesus Christ, our merciful high priest who is pleading the efficacy of his blood 24-7 to get us into heaven, not keep us out. It's a beautiful message. Adventism, correctly understood, finds its center in Jesus. And I'm going to expound up upon this later, but Jesus is front and center of God's Word. 
It presents him as the divine Son of God who has existed for all eternity, but who became flesh and blood and dwelt among us. And there are six official positions that we find in sacred scripture of Jesus. He is the great creator. Then he became a, the greatest prophet who ever walked the face of this earth. Then he went to Calvary's cross and died as our Savior. Then he ascended to heaven and entered the heavenly sanctuary to become our high priest. Then at the end of time, we see him working not only as mediator of mankind, but what else? As judge. And when his work of judgment is completed, he comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus is the great creator. Creator. He is the greatest prophet who ever lived. He is the savior of all mankind. He is the high priest interceding on your behalf and my behalf. And at the end of time, he works as judge. And when his work of judgment is finished and complete, he will come back as king of kings and lord of lords. Now check this out. As creator, he made you. As Savior, or I'm sorry, as prophet, he lived for you. As Savior, he died for you. As high priest, he intercedes for you. As judge, he acquits you according to Daniel chapter 7. And as king, he comes for you. What a beautiful message. Amen. Let me repeat that one more time. As creator, he what? Made you. As prophet, he lived for you. As savior, he died for you. As high priest, he intercedes for you. As judge, he acquits you. And as king, he comes for you. God is madly in love with you. You and I are his by creation and redemption. And so we have nothing to be ashamed of with our beautiful message. And every doctrine is connected to one or more of these six official positions of Christ. But truth must find its center in the man Christ Jesus. And the foundation of all truth is his agape love, his unchanging, self-sacrificing love for the human race. And the canopy that surrounds this beautiful portrait is the great controversy theme. Yes, there is a warfare going on right now between Christ and Satan. And the battleground is the human heart, is the human heart. And Jesus wants to convince us that he's not against us, but that he is for us. And this is what the, 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 the challenge that you and I face is convincing people that Jesus is not against his children, his creation. He is for them. And he is working 24-7, 365, not to keep people out of the kingdom of heaven, but to get them into the kingdom of heaven. So this morning, before I begin, I would like to um, have a word of prayer. But uh, before we have prayer, I want to let you know that we have an awesome church board here. I really enjoyed hanging out with them Tuesday. But they do have a heart for the Lord. And they have a desire to reach our community for Almighty God. And so they already gave me a $1,000 budget to start buying literature and and um, uh, a literature rack. So out in the foyer, I have purchased a box of Great Controversies, Desire of Ages, Victory in Christ by W.W. W. Prescott, the most beautiful little devotional book I have read in a long time, and then some books on the Sabbath. And guess what? God wants you to be a missionary. He wants you to be a soul winner. And I want to challenge you to, to grab some of those books, put them in your car, and pray for an, a, divine, a divine appointment. And God will give you a divine appointment. Do you know that the majority of people that come into our church will come in through the reading of our literature? And we are to get the literature out like the leaves of autumn. God will give you courage. He will give you boldness to be a missionary for him. Because that's why we exist. If we're not missionaries, we have no reason to have a church here in Southside, Indiana. Do we? But God is going to use, he's going to do amazing things here. I really believe that. Amazing things. And he's going to use humble people like you and I. And I say, Lord, if you can use me with all my warts and defects, go ahead. You can use me. Um, 
So that is one thing I want to uh, share with you. And another thing, I would like to meet with the elders after the worship service. I want to share some good news with them. So if we can meet briefly here uh, up front in, in the uh, church here, I, I would like to uh, just speak to them for briefly for like five minutes. Okay? Well, let's begin with an additional word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can come to you and worship you on this, your holy Sabbath day. I want to thank you for everyone here this morning. Lord, we acknowledge that we are yours by creation and redemption. Lord, we have been bruised and battered in this old world. But Lord, we are, we're wanting to hear your voice speak to our hearts this morning. So I ask in a very special way that you through your Holy Spirit would be present, guiding and directing our thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at the age of five, his father showed him a pocket compass. The young lad was really intrigued by the mysterious behavior of the needle. No matter which way he turned the compass, the needle always pointed in the same direction. Well, this created a desire within his heart to uncover some of the hidden mysteries of science. This young boy grew up, as all young boys do, and became one of the greatest scientists of modern times. Now, Albert Einstein is best known for his theory on relativity, and the mathematical equation he used to illustrate this theory was E equals mc squared. Now, in this formula, E stands for energy, m stands for mass, and C squared stands for the velocity of speed of light multiplied into itself. And we know that light travels at 186,282 miles per second. Now you take that number and multiply it by 1,860, etc. You know what I'm saying. Now, believe it or not, this formula reveals something very significant. It reveals that there is an enormous amount of energy stored up in mass. Now let me illustrate what I'm referring to. If you have had one pound of matter and you could release all the energy and every uh, one of the atoms in that pound of matter it would be the equivalency of detonating 10 million tons of TNT that's a lot of a lot of energy now the question I have for you this morning how did all that energy get stored up in matter who put it there? Well, what was our scripture reading this morning? Psalm 33, verse 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Before there was a universe, there was God. And God spoke, and what had not existed suddenly came into existence. So God spoke, and there was a universe. Before God spoke, there was no materials in which to compose and build this universe. But after God spoke, what happened? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Now, is there a difference between the word of God and the word of man? Let me hear from you. Yes. yes. Now, if Almighty God was here and he said, let there be a palm tree growing in the middle aisle of the South Side Church, what would happen? What would happen? There would be a palm tree growing in the middle aisle of the South Side Church. Now, if I had a young person and I asked that young person to say simply, let there be a palm tree growing in the middle aisle of the Southside Church, what would happen? Nothing would happen. So you can clearly see the difference between the word of man and the word of God. Now listen carefully. Book Education, page 126. 
the creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power, it begets life. Every command is a promise, accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the Infinite One. It transforms the nature, or the character, and recreates the soul in the image of God. Isn't that a powerful quotation? Education 126, one more time. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power, it begets life. Every command is a promise accepted by the will, received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the Infinite One. And it transforms the character and recreates the soul in the image of God. Thus it is through the Word, by the Word, that the creative energy can bring about a change in your life and my life. It is by the Word and through the Word that our world came into existence. Now, the Bible reveals at least six different areas whereby God's creative power was revealed through His Word and by His Word. Now, these areas are creation week. The hearing miracles of, I'm sorry, the healing miracles of Jesus, the resurrection miracles of Jesus, the deliverance miracles of Jesus, the transformation miracles of Jesus, and the nature miracles of Jesus. So let's briefly look at a few of these areas. Genesis chapter 1, if you brought your Bible. Genesis chapter 1, and let's begin in verse 1. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Word of God says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, what? What did God say? Let there be light, and there was light. All throughout Genesis chapter 1, we see that God speaks and what had not existed suddenly comes into existence. Now on day two of creation week, what did God create? He created the atmosphere. Now, you and I know that the atmosphere, at least today, is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% carbon dioxide, argon, and a few other noble gases. So God speaks on day number two, and the atmosphere suddenly comes into existence. Day number three, God speaks. Day number four, God speaks. Day number five, God speaks. Day number six, God speaks. And what has not existed suddenly comes into existence. Now, what is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? The Old Covenant is simply man promising to do great things for God. Remember ancient Israel camped outside of, uh, on, on the borders of Mount Sinai? Moses, their fearless leader, is communing with God a miraculous fast for 40 days. Not a drop of water touches the tip of his tongue. Not a morsel of food enters his stomach. And what is ancient Israel doing down there after they had promised God, all that you have said, we will do. Well, what were they doing? Were they sincere? Did they lack sincerity? No, they were sincere. We have no pro a power within ourselves to do God's divine will. We are weak and feeble. See, God doesn't want you and I to make promises to Him. He wants us to believe the promises that He has given to us in His Word. And the promises contain the creative power that brought the universe into existence. He wants us to receive the Word of God, believe the Word of God, accept the Word of God, and expect that the Word of God will accomplish the will of God. Amen. That's a huge difference between the Word of God and the Word of man. Now go to Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1 beginning in verse 40. Mark chapter 1 beginning in verse 40. 
The word of God reads, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be what? Be healed, be cleansed. Then the key verse, verse 42, as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Do you understand the significance of that story? There was a man that came down with leprosy. A mycobacterium entered his body and began to destroy every organ system within him. His integumentary system, his endocrine system, his nervous system, his digestive system, his respiratory system, etc. His body was rotting away. He was separated from his family. He was separated from his friends. He lived a very lonely, solitary life. He heard about Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He heard marvelous reports about this miracle worker from the city of Nazareth. And his faith was activated. Well, he discovered where Jesus was. He ran to him, probably clearing out whoever was standing by our Lord and Savior. He fell to his knees and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me what? Clean. And Jesus said, I am willing. Moved with compassion, he reached out and touched the leper. I am willing, be thou cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, what happened? He was healed. He was healed. Yes, there is a major difference between the word of God and the word of man. Now, how does this relate to you and me? Well, before we look at an amazing story in Matthew chapter 8, I would like to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. The Word of God says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Did you catch that? This is huge. This is huge. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received whose word? God's word. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which also actively, effectively works in you who what? Believe. Remember, there is a difference between the word of man and the word of God. Let there be a palm tree growing in the middle aisle of the Southside Church. Do you guys see the palm tree there? You don't, do you? Why? Because there is no power in my word. But if Almighty God was standing here and said, let there be a palm tree growing in the middle aisle of the Southside Church, instantly there would be a palm tree right in the middle aisle. So why is it that we make promises to God? Why not start believing the promises that He has given to us in His Word? Let's do away with all that you have said we will do with Lord this is the promise that you have given to me, and I believe it. And I'm claiming this promise. The Word of God is self-fulfilling. God doesn't need your help or my help, does He? Now, we're going to see this illustrated clearly in Matthew chapter 8. By the way, a trivia question. When Jesus was here on earth, He... he uh, what is the word I'm looking for? He affirmed two people, only two people, for having great faith. 
Can anyone tell me the two individuals that Jesus affirmed for having great faith? By the way, the great faith that Jesus affirmed in these two individuals, these people were not Jews. They were Gentiles. Who were these two individuals? The, the what? The Roman centurion, and who else? Yes, the lady from Syrophoenicia. So let's look at Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 8. Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. And let's drop down to verse 5. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion, that would be a captain having 100 soldiers underneath him, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word or the word and my servant shall be what healed for I also am a man under authority having soldiers under me and I say to this one go and he goes and to another come and he comes and to my servant do this and he does it when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. A Roman centurion, fondly connected to his servant, sought out Jesus opened up his heart and said, Lord, I have this individual back at my home who's very dear to my heart, and he is dreadfully tormented. The other reading in Luke says that he was at the point of death. Jesus said, listen, I will go with you to your house, and yes, I will heal your servant. And how did the Roman centurion respond? Listen, I am not worthy that such a, uh, an individual of your stature should come under my roof. Listen, I'm a man of authority. I have a lot of soldiers underneath me. And, and I tell them, go and they go. Others come and they come. Do this and they do it. And then he said, listen, only speak the word and my servant shall be healed. Again, you and I must hear the word, we must believe the word, and we must receive the word and expect that the word of God will accomplish the will of God. Yes, the leper heard the word. He received the word. He believed the word. And he expected that the word of God would accomplish the will of God. The, Re the Roman centurion, yes, he knew about Jesus, what he was capable of doing. But he believed the word he received the word, and he expected the word to accomplish the will of God. Isn't that powerful? For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively, actively works in you who believe. Another story that has impressed me for many, many years is the story found in Luke chapter 8. There is a a ruler of the synagogue. His name is Jairus. Obviously, he's a father and he's fondly connected to his precious daughter, only 12 years of age. So he 
seeks out the miracle healer. And when he finally finds him, he opens up his heart and said, listen, my daughter, she's only 12 years of age. I love her to pieces, but she's back home, deathly ill at the point of death. Please come and heal her. And how did Jesus respond in the narrative? He, how did he respond? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll do that. So as they are approaching the ruler's house, someone comes out and says to him, listen, don't bother the master any longer. Why not? Because your daughter now is dead. I can imagine tears began to cast gay down his cheeks. But Jesus gave him hope and assurance. Please take me into your daughter's bedroom. Once inside the bedroom with the mother and father, Peter, James, and John, what does Jesus do in that story? He takes the little girl by her hand and he says, Talitha Kumai, which being interpreted means what? Young girl, I say unto thee, arise. Her heart began to beat. The gastric juices in her stomach began to churn. The blood in her arteries and veins began to circulate. Electrical impulses began to jump from one neuron to the next. Her eyes opened up and she saw the face of her creator and redeemer and healer. Those ears heard the Word of God. Obviously, they received the Word of God, and it was the Word of God that brought her back to life. If you feel like you are spiritually dead, that God is a million miles away, I want you to give him a chance. I would like to encourage you to spend time every day in studying the Word of God. And I want you to read the Word of God not like an evolutionist. Now, as Adventists, we say, we believe in creation, but do we really? Think about it. Do we really believe in creation or do we believe in evolution? Oh yeah, God, maybe, yeah, you, you have all these promises in your word, but maybe they apply to someone else, not me. I'm not good enough. No, this is God's love letter to you. And every command and every promise God has made to you personally. And you must receive the Word of God not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, and the Word of God will work in you. Now in Mark chapter 5, the disciples are in the boat with Jesus. They're crossing the Sea of Galilee. A very tempestuous storm arises. Water is filling the boat. Jesus is asleep. The disciples are panic-stricken. And they forget that Jesus is with them. And they cry out when they discover Jesus is asleep. Hey, you got to help us. Save us or we perish. So what did Jesus do in that narrative? Standing on the bow of that boat, these words came out of his mouth. Peace be still. Is there a storm in your heart this morning? Is there? Maybe you didn't do as well on a test at school. Maybe you're taking summer classes. Or maybe there is a, a battle going on between you and someone else. Relationship problems. And you, you know the storm, don't you? You know it. But here's the good news. You have a loving Savior that cares about you. And if He can calm that storm-tossed sea, can't He calm the nerves that are frazzled in your life? He can. 
He can. Yes, you and I must believe the Word of God, we must receive the Word of God, and you and I must expect that the Word of God will accomplish the will of God. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively, actively works in you who believe. Well, may God bless you as you hear the word, as you receive the word, and as you expect the Word to accomplish the will of God in your life.